Well, hi all. Well, as always, a big thank you for joining us. Well, after our last video in Europe, lots of you contacted us about the specifics. You want to know the nitty gritty. And so we've compiled a list of all the facts and information that you need to know for long-term travel in Europe before you leave the UK. We're the Gaptikators, Phil and Izzy. In 2018, we sold our house and all our possessions for life on the road. Since then, we've been exploring Europe and Asia by motorhome and now in our truck Tonka. Join us on our travels as we endeavor to explore the world. And for those weekly updates, please consider liking, subscribing, and hitting that bell notification. But enough of me talking, let's get on the road. Right, with cup of tea in hand, we are... You need a cup of tea. Of course you do. Uh, <laughs> Although we are quite low on tea bags now. We are, but yeah. Not long until we're back in the UK. Anyway, let's get back to this. And this video is probably geared towards people who are looking to full time, spending long periods of time in Europe and want, wanting to know the sort of practicalities, the, you know, what do I need to know to keep me within the law? What do I need to know um, to, to make life easier when I'm actually in Europe? Um, and so, and we've been doing this for in our fifth, fifth year and so it's really on the back of our experience and our, our not our fields, but our sort of, our steep learning, if you like. Um, so anyway, first point, and I think it's a really, really important point. Uh, and I've written a list this time so I can read the notes. <laughs> um, we've written down here, no fixed address, home address. Okay, and we actually use Izzy's mum's address and she has been superb. So she has, I mean, this is really about if you sell your house or you, you rent your property out. Um, yeah, how do you receive mail? How do you maintain a credit footprint in the UK? What about registering your vehicle and your driving license and so on? If you can use a relative's address, that is absolutely the best way to do it because mm. the DVLA won't allow you to use a virtual address uh, to register your vehicle um, or your driving license. Um, I, I should have said, um, we actually sold our house and all our possessions and we thought when we left, in the world that we live in, everything would be digitised and we wouldn't need hard copy mail, so to speak, but that really isn't the case. And it doesn't matter what you say to companies, you will always get a follow-up letter, um, and particularly around medical, and, and which we'll come on to, you will always get something through the post. And that might be an insurance policy, it might be... You, you also, you might want to maintain um, your position on the local electoral roll. Yeah. Um, and of course you need an address for that. Um, so, if you can, use a relatives. If you can't, there are a couple of things that you can potentially look at. There is a service called Boat Mail, um, and they will um, give you a mailbox and open all your mail for you um, and let you know of anything that you need to know about. Um, my understanding is that the DVLA, under special circumstances, may allow you to register your vehicle in that way. Um, there is some detailed information and some links um, in a post on our website about living in a motorhome. Uh, we'll put the link in the, the description for you so you can have a look at that. It might not work, um, but th their policy certainly says that it is possible. So that if you have no other avenue, you don't have a relative or a friend whose address you can use, um, that is obviously a, a, a route that you could maybe explore. Yeah. I should maybe say at this point, um, we've written an awful lot of posts on these topics, be it healthcare, be it you know, traveling uh, in terms of equipment and so on. Um, it's on our website. And so what I'll do is, I'll just say it now at the start, we'll actually put those links for all those various posts in the description below. So if you are interested, click on that. And at the end of the video, I'll put a link to the previous video, if you haven't seen it, uh, just to make, it life, make life easier for you. Right, next on the list is money. And we're not going to talk about... Um, what it costs, the budget, and, and, and so on. We're going to do a separate video on that. Uh, this is about how you manage money. Um, how much cash you have, do you need cash, uh, and so on. So... I, I am like the Queen, I never carry any cash. Um, but Phil thinks cash is king. Uh, mm. So I, I probably a mix of both is good. Um, your traditional bank account, your NatWest, your Halifax, whoever, they're probably going to charge you uh, for using a card abroad um, and taking money out on an ATM, and they're probably not going to give you a great exchange rate either. Uh, there are lots of newer 
accounts. So you, there's prepaid accounts like Caxton where you can transfer money in every month um, into, and the, the money then becomes euros. So you're exchanging one large amount at a time, which probably get you a better interest rate. There are borderless um, banks like Wise, uh, who we use, um, and you can have um, an account in America, in Europe, in the UK, um, and so move your money around like that. And then there are other um, internet-based accounts like Sterling and Revolut, um, and they allow you to use your card abroad at no extra cost. Almost all of those accounts um, have a limit on how much cash you can take out in, in a rolling month. Mm. Uh, the only one that doesn't actually is Caxton. Um, so you probably need to do a little bit of research before you set off around this to make sure you get your choice right because uh, it's quite difficult to change once you're in Europe and you can't receive a card anywhere. Um, I think when you're in Western Europe, um, you know, in the UK and Western Europe, you automatically think everyone takes a card. Everything's contactless. You just wave a card, you know, it beeps and, and that's it. And that really isn't the case. And I think when you go, you know, obviously we've got the Euro, but some countries, you know, a little bit further afield, like Bulgaria and Hungary, Romania, don't use the Euro. And so... When, once you start going a little bit further afield, you'll find that things are maybe more cash based. And so that's why I swear by cash. And so we always make a point, we've always had a little slush fund that if something happens at the side of the road, you've got a problem, at least you've got cash. And so Izzy would be in a world of pain because she doesn't carry any cash. And she'll say to me, have you got any cash? Oh, yeah, well, I have, thank you. Um, so have access to cash as well. Yeah. I agree. Okay, next up on the list, we've got medical, dental and health insurance, and we've sort of categorised them um, in a little sort of package. Uh, and there is a reason for that, and we'll, we'll come on to it in a moment. Um, first thing I would say is, if you haven't got a GH card, uh, a global health insurance card, then definitely go and get one. Um, to give you an example, about 18 months ago now, mm, yeah. I got shingles. I was in Spain and I was floored. I was really in, not in a good place. And I went to the Spanish hospital and cut a long story short, for about two months, they looked after me and the standard of care was excellent. And I mean, did, you weren't in hospital for two months. Wasn't in hospital. You, you were seeing the doctor regularly. They gave you all the medication you needed. Yeah. Um, the medication was all at half price because we had the G-Hit card. Yeah. But uh, what I'm saying is the, the care, if you like, or yes. the, the duration of the yeah. illness, lasted about, about two yeah. months and it hit me really hard and it just from the from the start the whole process mm -hmm. was excellent what i would say is the standard of care yeah. was excellent so the, the GHIC is the new iteration of what was the eHIC and before that that was the e111 you shouldn't have to pay for it there are some websites out there that suggest you might need to but you should be able to order it for free um, using your national insurance number they usually arrive within a week or so in the post. Yep. And if you do have the old EHIC card, it still stands. It does, until it runs out. Remember, the GHIC can't be used in Norway or Switzerland. Um, and, and it really is for emergencies. Yeah, it is. The, the other thing that's important about having a GHIC is if you take out travel insurance, um, which we'll come on to in a moment, um, most travel insurance companies will ask you to make to use your GHIC card first before their insurance kicks in um, so that you're getting the most of what you've got for free basically be before you need the, the travel insurance for any medical needs. And not in a private hospital? No, not obviously, n well you can't use your GHIC in a private no. hospital but we'll come on to travel insurance in a moment. Yeah. Um, so... Okay. Yeah, so I was just going to go on to the GHIC won't cover longer term uh, medication needs or no. longer, longer term healthcare needs. So if you've got a condition uh, and you're looking to sort of spend, you know, 12 months abroad, then what, what I suggest you do, advise you to do, is speak to your GP or your doctor, special consultant, whoever, before you leave the UK and try and put a measure in place to get that, either get the medication mm. uh, in advance or some sort of arrangement so that you can sort of preempt um, mm. any problem you might have when you're in Europe. And let's just backtrack very quickly there. If you do sell your property or rent it out and you're no longer at that address, you may find that the GP surgery might remove you from their list. So mm. make sure you get registered um, with the surgery that's associated with whatever address you're going to be using uh, when you're traveling. Which So we're registered at my mum's GP surgery now uh, because we're obviously registered at her address too. Yeah. Um, 
So it's not going to give you specialist care either. So in, in no. terms of so so for example, um, I've got a bit of a problem with my hands. Uh, I need to see somebody at some point, especially at some point, and um, get that sorted. Or if you have in terms of ladies, uh, mammograms and and why don't you let me talk about the lady bits? That's a lady good bits. <laughs> That's a good idea. Talk <laughs> yeah. about lady bits. Um, one of the things I was worried about when I came away was being able to have a cervical smear uh, or a mammogram. Um, and it, it just turned out, I, I luckily I had the smear um, just before we left. Um, so I don't need another one probably for about four years. Uh, so I, I have one coming up soon. Um, the mammogram I haven't been able to have. Um, every time they offered it to me, I just wasn't there or I couldn't be there when they wanted me to have it. Um, of course, it's all set up assuming that you, you live where your GP is. Uh, so I've made the decision not to have the mammogram at the moment, um, and I'm okay with that, but you might not be, so you might want to get it organised uh, bef before you leave. Um, that would be probably the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Uh, the other thing to think about in terms of um, uh, your GP surgery uh, is to make them aware that you're going to be away um, so that they know if they're writing to you at home um, if that address still exists, that they, they need, can get in touch with you in another way. So hours ring us now or they text us mm -hmm. uh, when they want to let us know about flu jabs and things like that. Yeah. Um, we've been sort of talking there and sort of bringing um, travel insurance into it or, or sort of health insurance into it. And so it is sort of tied up when you're traveling sort of longer term. Um, and we would suggest that you, you basically take out travel insurance or health insurance from the off because a lot of companies won't insure you whilst you're on the road or well, they will but they'll charge you a lot extra yeah uh, so it's worth doing um, we use backpackers insurance from true traveler they've been excellent we haven't had to claim but certainly our, our you know contact with them has been good mm. um, they seem to offer a really comprehensive package you also get lots of things covered as part of their standard sports pack um, so we've been we've been really happy with them and we'll put a link uh, in the description just to know it is an affiliate link so if you do buy some services from them, we'll get some money from that, but it will be at no cost to you. Um, there was something else I felt like I wanted to, oh, it was about medication. I wanted to talk about medication. Mm -hmm. um, people contact us and we see quite a lot of um, posts on, you, uh, not YouTube, sorry, Facebook, okay. asking about what to do about medication because most GPs will only give you three months. And if you're on HRT or some other medication that you need to take every day for, long, for a, 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 <coughs> a condition, um, it, that can be quite difficult. We have found um, that you can get things like antibiotics quite easily over the counter without a prescription um, in lots of European countries. And we have heard, but we haven't done this ourselves, that if you have the, the box with the medication and the label on it from your GP back in the UK, and you take that in with your passport to a pharmacy, they may well sell you that medication over the counter. But I can't say what countries that happens in. Um, and. I, it, it may be that some pharmacists are willing to do it and others aren't because I just don't know the legislation around that. So I think it's something you need to talk to your own GP about if you need that long term medication b before you leave the UK. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so I'm going to bring dental in on this as well. Yes. Um, so before we left for full time travel, uh, we we got our teeth sorted, uh, not just cleaned. I mean, I'm talking, you know, we, we really spent a considerable amount of money and time uh, making sure they were absolutely you know, tip top shape. Uh, because the last thing we wanted was to have a dental problem on the road. Uh, now, periodically, probably about twice a year, depending on the country's rain, you know, Spain, Turkey, wherever it is, we will go and get our teeth cleaned. And I have to say, the level of service is excellent. And probably the biggest thing is they're so flexible. It's, you can it's sort been of a ring. revelation, really, mm, hasn't it's it? It's been fabulous. I mean, you can you can ring. It's not like the UK at all. You can sort of ring it. We were in Spain, for example. You can ring up and say, oh, do you want to come in this afternoon? Uh, uh, no, uh, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow morning's fine. Yeah. Um, Turkey's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is, I think we're all a little, this is on a medical side and uh, a dental side, we're maybe a little bit sort of guilty of, of sort of thinking that the standard of care, the, the hygiene levels um, maybe aren't what they are in the UK. And I would say that is absolutely not the yeah, case. The level of care and um, cleanliness that we've experienced has been superb. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, that's really not a factor. And actually, very good value for money. Yes, agreed. 
and, and, and easy to access, which has been a real pleasure. Yeah, well, particularly when you're on the road. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, next up on the list is vehicle insurance. And I know this is something that Izzy, Izzy always deals with our admin. Um, she likes to be in control. And so, uh, and we've just done our, renewed our vehicle insurance. So Izzy has spent some considerable time um, going down that pathway. So Izzy, over to you. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of things to be aware of. If you are full-timing um, in vehicle insurance language, i.e. you have no bricks and mortar address to return to, so you've either rented your property or you've sold it, you, you really need to get proper full-time cover um, because you are considered bizarrely to be a higher risk when you're actually living in your van. Um, there is only one company that offers full-time cover in the UK um, and that's Aviva and they offer it through Comfort, who are a broker, or Adrian Flux, who are also a broker. Um, if you decide not to take full-time cover out but you don't have a bricks and mortar property to return to and you have an accident, they, they probably will find out and it will invalidate your insurance so I think it's up to you about whether you take the risk or not. Um, there are also another a number of other companies um, like Comfort, Safeguard, Sterling, um, Stavely Head, who will cover you for 365 days in Europe. They don't specifically ask whether you're full-timing or not, and I would suggest that you don't tell them that that's what you're doing. You just take the cover, the 365 days, um, and, and go on your travels. Um, our experience of having full-time insurance was that it was almost double uh, the cost of mm. just regular insurance. Um, but you do need to just make sure that you're comfortable with whatever policy you take out in, in the end. Um, a, a lot of insurance uh, companies will also offer breakdown cover as part of the package, um, but much of that is limited to the weight and the age of your vehicle. Uh, so if you've got an older motorhome or a larger motorhome... Or a DIY. Yeah, you might find in the small print that you're not actually covered. So. We'll talk about breakdown cover a little bit later, um, but just be aware of that if that is offered as part of the package. And something else to think about, because again, people have contacted us because they they want to work on the road, is is maybe think about business cover as well. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're working whilst you're traveling, again, just something else to bear in mind, yeah. just to make sure you're covered. Yeah, that's a good point. So, segueing into breakdown cover from insurance. If you decide not to take out the cover that your insurer offers you, um, we would highly recommend RAC Arrive. Uh, it is a specific uh, cover for motorhomes. Um, it will cover you for 365 days in Europe, but their Europe cover is really generous. It actually also covers Georgia, um, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, it, what it doesn't cover is the Asian side of Turkey. Uh, it only covers the European side of Turkey. But to be honest, if you're going to break down, Turkey's the place to break down because yeah. everybody knows somebody that's got a garage where you can get stuff fixed. And, and you won't get ripped off. No, uh, it, it, it's not expensive and they're very conscientious. Um, so the breakdown cover, uh, you need to organise it before you leave um, if you decide to go with it. Uh, and we'll put a link to RAC Arrive uh, in, in the description. I would say uh, it's, it's like all of these things, whether it's healthcare or breakdown cover, the chances are at some point in the road, particularly if you're full time, you're yeah. going to need medical cover. You're going to need a breakdown cover of some sort. You, you, you're going to need it. So if you try and wing it, you yeah, but, but, it. by all means wing it, but it, it might end, end up costing you a lot of money yeah, um, true. at some point. Um, okay, so I've got down here as well breakdown equipment. Uh, so I'm not talking about sort of tools and that sort of thing. I'm talking about sort of the, the legal requirement, the sort of the minimum amount of equipment you've got to carry with you. The high vis vest, um, the warning triangle. Um, and every country has its own criteria. And so, for example, coming in in Spain, it's actually come in 2021. And by 2026, you've got a basically they're replacing the warning triangle with the V16 beacon. Uh, which is just a little flashing light. Uh, so again, lot, lots of people spend time in Spain, so just be aware of that. Mm. Uh, and you, you it, and you can buy them on Amazon. You can buy yeah. them in, in garages. You can buy them all over the place. You need to think about things like the angle mort stickers in France um, and the requirement now for snow chains and mountain tyres under their ma mountain law. Um, but what you can do is look at our motorhome um, country-specific touring guides uh, where you'll find all of that information that you need. Again, we'll put a link in the description. It's a bit of common sense and it yeah. is things like, you know, some vans, because of um, 
weight saving measures don't have a spare wheel so you know have you got a spare wheel if you haven't what is your your backup if it's a can of spray then good luck uh so it, again it's all something to think about okay so probably one of the questions we get asked most is about the mot um and i've done a lot of research about this on various overlanding forums and uh, you know uh, spoken to the dvla there is legally no way around it for your vehicle to be legal outside of the uk it needs to be legal in the country in which it's registered and part of that requirement is having an mot and it's highly likely that it'll also be a requirement from your insurer maybe when you go to morocco uh, you're a Turkey, Bulgaria, a country where you have to, where your green card that comes from your regular insurance company isn't going to cover you. Yeah, you'd be out, you'd be fine without an MOT because you don't need your regular insurance to give you that surety. You're, you're you're buying that separately. But the minute you come back into Europe, you're going to be breaking the law. And I know that you can get off the boat in Dover and drive to your MOT station, and technically that's legal. But what about that week that it takes you to cross Europe to get? to Calais or wherever you're going to sail to Dover from. Because that thing is not, it's not a problem until it's a problem. Yeah. So if you're if you're just further afield, you're outside of Europe, you're in Turkey, you're in Morocco, wherever it is, and you've got insurance. Now we've never been asked um, to prove the roadworthiness of our no. vehicle. We've never been asked for the MOT. All the border crossings, customs, you name it, never. Even when we've been stopped by the police, no one's ever asked us uh, to, to evidence that. And so, yeah, you can get away with it, until but there's a problem. If you had an accident and your vehicle was deemed unroadworthy, the cause of the accident, they, they might want to see that MOT certificate. And if you can't provide it, then that will invalidate your insurance um, and might make you, I suppose, responsible for a huge yeah. amount of cost and other, you know, in injury and damage to other people in their vehicles. So as painful as it is, yeah. it, we come back every year we've had people honestly over the years say oh you know if you if you go try try um uh spain a turf or an itv but even within no, europe sorry gibraltar oh what about gibraltar no it's no. a non-starter you yeah. can't do that no. um people say oh yeah if you if you read if, sorry if you if you get a ukrainian if you get a obviously not at the moment no. uh if you get a uh, register your vehicle in another country in Europe and then the problem is then you've got to import your vehicle yeah. into that country it's going to be registered yeah. in that country and so it's it just isn't worth the no. hassle and so, even within Europe there is no you can't you can't have your MOT in in Germany on a Spanish vehicle or vice versa that there, there, there is no crossover yeah. um so that yeah it, as depressing as it is there is really no way around it Okay, next up is gas. Izzy, I know you're busting to talk about gas. That is so exciting, that's why. You. So, we all use gas. We use it for cooking. Most people use it for cooking for their fridge, for their heating. Um, but what you need to know is that your European, um, your UK gas bottles cannot be refilled in Europe unless you have a refillable system. So, if you have a bog standard bottle from Cala, you can't bring it to Europe and swap it for another one and you can't get it refilled. So, if you if you choose that option, you could well end up six months into your European trip having to buy a gas bottle in Italy or somewhere like that. Obviously, that involves a lot of cost. You're going to need a different regulator um, and you can't dispose of your UK bottle in Europe. So we would strongly advise you to look at something like a gas low or a gas fill system that you can fill from the pump or safe fill bottles that you can also fill from the pump, but they're just not on a, a special system. Um, you get different little fittings for each country that you carry around with you. Um, and the gas that you get from the pump is about two thirds cheaper um, than it is when you buy it in a bottle ready filled. So actually, if you were coming to Europe for a year, let's say, you'd make the money back on what it costs to have it filled. Um, so that's just an awareness, really. Just one very quick one mm. on that. Regardless of what it says in Park for Night in terms of, oh, if you go to this place, you'll get them filled. Some of the German bottles uh, sorry, some of the companies have the capacity to fill the German bottles, but we've been to a number of these places. But not UK bottles. N and they will not fill UK bottles at all. No. Every single one of them. Even the dodgy ones, they won't even entertain it. <laughs> not that we go to dodgy places. No. <laughs> okay, what's up next? Okay, next up is washing washing clothes. Um, so you can take your, your clothes to the laundrette, uh, a service point, uh, or... You can take them to, if you don't have a washing machine, uh, you can take them to one of these outdoor 
washing sort of service Re- points. Revolution if you like. laundries, I think. They're called. Yeah, well, I think it depends on the country you're in, but we've mm. we've we've seen these popping up at little, usually it's supermarkets, garages, yeah, garage four courts, yeah, and you'll see these washers and dryers, different sizes. The smaller machine generally is about sort of five or six euros. The bigger machine is about ten euros. Um, and they they're pretty sophisticated, so you don't need detergent. So it's so it's all in. They're really uh, they're the perfect solution for motorhomers because you can turn up, stick your washing in, make a cuppa, um, you know, and wait for it to finish. Yeah. Um, so we we have travelled with a washing machine in the past. Um, well, we still do. We still do. They're, they're handy to have if you like to wild camp. But to be honest, the the availability now of these sorts of washing machines is making us think maybe we don't need a washing machine. They're yeah. re- really easy to use, um, and they're all over the place. Uh, mm-hmm. So. So we used one just the other day. So yeah. for example, we we turned up, we put our washing in, we went and did some shopping because it was by a big yeah. supermarket. We came out, we put it in, put the shopping away. Did we then put the washing into the dryer? Had a cup of had tea. Had lunch. And it was done. And that was it. So, and it was really convenient. Yeah. And yeah, it did make us yeah. think. Yeah. Um, I think they're generally probably cheaper than using a campsite washing machine. Although if you're parked up somewhere for a couple of weeks and you've got a washing line, it's quite handy. So to of course you should have said that. Yeah. Of course you've always, always yeah, got yeah, the option yeah. of yeah. of campsites. But it's it's a it's one of those questions that people ask because actually keeping on top of your washing can be expensive. And you know if you well I don't know how much we spend a year on washing machines, but it's probably quite a bit. Um, so what I would say is though just a little sort of caveat on that. I mean we were actually pleased that we had our own washing machine this year because. In winter, where we were, we there was no campsite open, and we went round to a number of laundrettes, which yeah. were all closed. Yeah. And we thought, wow. And we knew we bumped into a few other people who were in the same sort of predicament. Yeah. And so it became a sort of a bit of an issue, not for us, but certainly for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, okay. Washing's not a very exciting subject, is no. it? Let's move on. Yeah. Okay. Next up on the list is telecoms, VPN, yeah. connectivity, and it's huge it's absolutely it's a massive topic it's an area that from a social media people asking questions wanting to know it's a really really big issue and of course we all want to stay connected on the road these days so where do we start is for this one well i think everything changed with great brexit um we we now have to pay that there is not a uk provider uh, well, not a regular UK provider, you know, either Vodafone, Orange, E, whatever they are, um, that will not limit your data somehow. So they're either going to cap the amount of data that you're going to use or they're going to cap the amount of time you can use it for. And most of them now say you can only spend two months abroad uh, using your data before they deem you a permanent traveller and cut you off. Um, most of them cap it at either 25 or 12 gig a month. Um, and on top of that, most of them now require you to pay for the days when you want to use that data as well. So there's like a triple whammy, mm-hmm. really, of restrictions, which is really frustrating. Um, you basically you've got a couple of options. One, um, you know, if you're going to be in Europe for any longer than a couple of months, that's just not going to work for you. So your your options then become one, you um, you buy a local SIM card, uh, and that works fine if you're staying in one country for a length of time. It can get a bit it can be a bit of a pain in the ass, you know, if you're only there for a week and you have to find somewhere to buy the SIM card. Um, But data like that can be expensive. Mm. Two, uh, you can get an eSIM, but even though they're more convenient, they are more expensive, but they're easier to keep on top of and you can buy them for regions. So there is no sort of regional European basic SIM card, but there is a regional European eSIM card that you can use. Um, But again, that's expensive too. Or three, you can try one of these new operators that are popping up, like Popit, like Connect Plus, like Tcom, like Lobster, um, who offer a slightly different service. Um, they piggyback off the back of the big boys in terms of using their servers um, and their towers and airtime, um, but they will allow you to use your data for a lot longer in Europe. So, for example, Popit, they offer 100 gig for £25 a month. It's a rolling contract, so you're not locked in. Um, and they say you can use that for up to six months. But when I asked them recently what that actually meant, they said, well, just talk to us and we'll sort something out with you. Um, Tcom, they offer 300 and 400 gig SIM cards across Europe. Um, so, so there are things that you can do. Uh, again, I have literally just written a post about this, the best SIM cards in Europe for long-term travellers. So we'll put the link in the description. Yeah, there is a lot of information in that post. Uh, we, we've only just touched on yeah. it, really. 
but the bottom line is if you want to go in and buy off the shelf buy data in terms of you know you walk into Vodafone you know you want 10 gig it's going to cost you a lot of money mm. so we were in just as an example we were in Vodafone the other day in Germany in Germany and it, you're looking at about three euros for a gigabyte which is which do you know what for a lot of people that's probably okay for us it's a problem because we probably use about 200 gigabytes a month um, so it depends on what your needs are and what you want to do with it I just said uh, Good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just touching on that as well if you do want to watch television when you're abroad and you don't want to use a satellite system which lots of people don't anymore you want to stream um, you may need a VPN uh, I know for a fact that Vodafone SIM cards will work in Europe because their servers are in the UK. Um, I'm, I don't know about any of the other big providers, um, so you might want to test that first. A VPN is easy, you can buy it online, you don't have to be in the UK, you can download it onto your phone in a couple of minutes, they're not difficult to set up, you, you're literally just pressing a button. And you can buy them for as little as four or five pounds a year, um, so just bear that in mind. Link in the description. Yeah, I'm stopping, <laughs> stopping <laughs> talking now. Okay. Just we're nearing the end of the list. Uh, next on the list is a second means of transport. Now, depending on the size of your van, your motorhome, your truck, whatever you're in, uh, you may want to consider a scooter, e-bikes, just bicycles, um, because it does make life a lot easier, especially if you want to go into cities, especially if you're you got a great little spot, you're all set up, you got your awning out, and you you know everything's out. You think, oh, this is this is great. Um, and then you've got to pack up because you, you want to, you know, you're in the middle of nowhere, as nice as you it is. You need to go and buy some milk. You need to go and buy some milk, you, you know. So you may want to think about, uh, you may have a van already, but if you're thinking about purchasing a van, you know, do you want a garage? Do you have a rack on the back? Do you have, uh, like I say, scooter versus e-bikes? And that's that's another sort of issue. Now, we've, we've, we've had both. Uh, we've had both together. Um, and so again, there's a place for, for each of them, but then we chose when we got the truck, we chose to do away with the bikes and just to keep the scooter because we, we generally felt that the scooter was, was more useful. We could go further. We could go more places. We could take all our luggage when we're going to the airport. We could, and we do tend to camp quite remotely as well. So yeah. It... And, or if you've got a problem, if, if I, if I get us bogged in somewhere, I can lower the scooter and. And, and go and get help. There's all sorts of reasons why it just sort of made more sense for us to keep the scooter. It's very specific yeah. to your needs. So if you're in a, a much smaller camper van and you're happy, you know, just quick pack up and sort of nipping, you know, getting some shopping, then then great. Uh, so, but it is definitely something to, to consider, especially across Europe where the cycleways mm. are really good. So, and lend themselves to, um, to exploring. Yeah, absolutely. So you may be thinking about what to pack um, and particularly if you are selling your property or renting it and you have to downsize, that can be quite hard. Uh, we took f way too much stuff for our first trip. I mean, I had like high heels with me. <laughs> Who needs high heels in a motorhome? Um, so we then, after about a year, we got rid of a load of stuff or we put it into storage. Um, I, I think what we now realise is that you can buy pretty much anything pretty much anywhere. I think we've had in four and a half years, we've had about three major calls. Yeah. Where we really thought, you know, I, I th look, you're, we're all guilty of it. You know, you go on holiday, you go away, you take too much stuff. The reality is you really do not need that much. You need probably half at the of most. Of what you think you what need. You think you yeah. need. Yeah. yeah. And when you full time, especially, you go, go away and you sort of think, yeah, what four seasons, I need this coat. I need those boots. I, I need my shorts. I need I need four pairs of flip flops. If you're Izzy, I need three handbags, and I need all. And so I think three is not too many. And I so think three is about right. It's sort of very, and I'm not going to talk about weight, but I'm I'm going to sort of mention, you know, when you're full timey, you do carry more stuff than of course you know you when do, you go on yeah. holiday. So have a real think about the yeah your payload, your, your sort of weight capacity. Yeah. So uh, that's that's a real biggie. Um, I mean. If we, you need something, if you need a particular plug or, I don't know, a gadget or something like that, most of Europe has Amazon and uh, most of Europe has Amazon lockers, lockers. or you can go and stand yeah. a campsite and have it delivered there. Yeah. Um, it's not hard to get hold of stuff, no. really. Um, Again, so, even further afield, you know, I mean, there's media marts all over the place. There's uh, really good supermarkets, be it Carrefour, even in yeah. Turkey, Romania, yeah. you'll, you'll see these big, huge stores with 
homeware and you know clothes yeah. and you, you name it yeah. usually it's cheaper so what i would say is the message is take half of what you need and then you can always buy stuff on the road not half of what you need half of what you think you need half of what you think you need <laughs> take half of what you need yeah. but you'll, you you won't have enough yeah um okay. let's talk about the schengen right it's, it's, it's a dirty word <laughs> it is it's uh, I mean, the b word you probably all know by now that you can only travel in schengen countries which are not necessarily european countries you can only travel in schengen countries um for 90 days in every 180 rolling days so that basically means that you can only spend 90 days in europe before you have to leg it to a non-schengen country for another 90 days pretty much um, um, and everyone pretty much knows that and we're not going to teach you to suck eggs but there's a couple of things there's a couple of um areas and questions where, where people still contact us even in recent well, weeks sorry go on you're going to say people often say to us how how do we manage it how do we get around it we're very lucky because phil has an irish passport so we can travel together um i as his spouse although you can do this if you're common law as well um, and we can travel together because there is a, an article, um, Piece of I can't even remember the number of it now, that says that Phil has the right to a private life and as his wife I can go with him. A lot of people have recently been saying um, when they're in the same situation as us that they're surprised that the spouse's passport is stamped. But of course the spouse's passport is stamped because if the spouse then wanted to go and travel on their own, how would um, border forces across the Schengen know where that spouse had been? Um, but the legislation is there. We have it printed out in a number of different languages in case we need to share it. But it, it's worked for us so far. There are other ways you can get around it. There are a number of countries now that are offering non-lucrative visas. France and Spain, for example, where you could stay for a year. Um, and there are some long-term visitor visas coming as well. Um, so that's potentially worth exploring. Uh, but the, probably the easiest way to get around it is just to go to a non-Schengen country every mm. three months. Um, so you're looking at Within easy reach, you're looking at Morocco, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, um, and a couple of smaller places like Andorra. Can't imagine why you'd want to go there for three months, but needs must. I think uh, the message in this is it is doable. So, for example, yes. this year, we've, we've had a pretty big year. We've been across to the Caucasus. But actually, even if we both have British passports or American passports or, you know, because it isn't just Brits, we, we would be fine. We because we haven't been in the Schengen for more than ninety days, mm. and so there there is ways around it, um, and so it's just a case of sort of having that sort of forethought. The weather's a big factor. Where do you want to yeah. be? You don't want to be um, having to get out of Spain in July to, and going into Morocco. That's just no, a be way too starter. Hot. So yeah. so it's really there's an element of planning yeah, that needs is. to take place there in all is. of this as well another non-schengen country is ireland as well which is absolutely worth exploring because it's beautiful and it's part of the common travel area yeah. um so there are there are definitely things you can do there is one one thing that i just wanted to mention because a couple of people have contacted me about this recently mm. is that if you are planning on your 90 days in say turkey or morocco who both have their own rules that say you can only be there for 90 days you can't do 90 days in the schengen and then on the 90th day go to morocco or turkey because what will happen is when you need to come back you will have overstayed your welcome in both places because the day that you leave the Schengen for Morocco or Turkey is counted as one day in each of those places. And a few people have, have come across. Out. Have come across. Yeah. yeah. Now um, it's possible that you may be able to extend your stay in Morocco, um, but I think it's quite a complicated process. And I, but we also know people that have been able to have their stay extended in Turkey at the border. Uh, but you can't guarantee those things, so it, it is far better to give yourself two or three days either side fudge factor. Um, we know you want to maximise your time in Europe, of course, but it, 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 it's better to um, to be on the safe side. And if you do overstay, you can be fined, you can be deported, you can have something in your passport that says you're not allowed to come back. Um, it's just not worth the risk for a few extra days, I don't think. No. Uh, so there are there are ways around it. And again, surprise, surprise, we do have a post on the website which you can read. It's got a bit more detail and a couple of sort of suggested itineraries that you might find helpful. Yeah. OK, next Last point on the list, you'd be <laughs> yeah. pleased to hear, is where to stop. And again, it's a very personal thing. We like the wild camp. It definitely is our go-to. Uh, some people don't. And therefore, um, 
what tools can you use? What schemes can you use to sort of help and maximize your time mm. whilst you're traveling across Europe? And so one of our big go-tos is Park for Night. And I think, you know, we've met lots of people on our travels, various nationalities. And when you're talking about good places to stay, Park for Night is probably probably the most referred to mm. app. Um, and it's not it's not just for off grid or while camping. It's for it's parking places for during the day. They have things like laundries, services, services, yeah. um, camp campsites, and airs and stale plats. Everything's on park for night. So generally, it's our sort of go to really. Yeah. Um, and I think the reviews on the whole are pretty honest. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, definitely. If you haven't got park for night, yeah, then definitely download the app. If you want to stay in a campsite. I would definitely get the Axi card because the chances are that if you're in Europe for more than yeah. a couple of months, you're going to be traveling out of season. So outside of season with Axi, you probably get about a 60% discount, I think, on most campsites that are in the scheme. You'll get the money back. The 20, uh, I think next within year. Within a week or two. 25 euros next year, I think. Yeah. Um, but, but with the Axi scheme, you get the pitch, um, electrics yeah. included, a shower a day is included. Um, it, it's absolutely worth doing. It really is. Yeah. Uh, and the other point is is some of the schemes that are out there and we've we've used these schemes and and we've really enjoyed them we have uh some more than others uh france passion is a little bit hit and miss yeah. if we're honest most of these schemes are about providers producers makers of food or wine or growers of things providing space on their land for you to stay some of them require you to spend money some of them don't yeah uh, we, we've used Portuguese camp. Thought it was excellent. Yeah, that was great. Um, particularly if you like a glass of wine, you want to, you know, yeah. pitch up and, and sort of, you're the only van in the middle of a vineyard and, and then sample the, the produce. Um, highly recommend it if you haven't looked at yeah. that. I think there's actually a post now. It's getting boring now. It is. Uh, there'll be a link in the description. Um, France Passion, you've already mentioned. Hispania uh, Discovery. Yeah. Again, if you're in Spain, that's that's a must. Um, relatively new scheme. It's yeah. It's going to two years, I think, now. Yeah. Um, no longer than that. It was about before COVID, yeah, but I don't know how long for. Yeah. Uh, and then there's Camper Con Gusto in Italy, which is similar. Yeah. Um, and Vinza Atlas in Germany. Um, there's a couple in Germany. Uh, there it? are a yeah. few of these schemes around. And obviously, Stel Plaz yeah. in general. If you look at our country specific guides, you'll find all of that information about campsites, about airs and stale plats, about, um, about these schemes, depending on the country. Um, so you can find that information there. So it's a real balance here. So it's about sort of mixing it up, but it's also about trying to keep the cost down because mm. if you want to, um, and this, this topic isn't about money, but if you want to keep the cost down, I think if you, if you go away, if you're looking full time or spend long periods of time in Europe and you want to stay in a campsite every night, it's going to be a really, really expensive exercise. Yeah. Uh, so you can stay in an excellent, Stell plats, for example, for five or six euros with electric. Well, some of them are free. Yeah, some are free, exactly. Yeah. Particularly you know. in France, quite a lot of the small village ones yes. tend to be well, free. France is well set up. Yeah, so. but France also has um, camping car parks as well, which are old municipal campsites that have been bought by this commercial company who make them into airs. So they're not, they're not fancy, but you've got electric, there's water, there's somewhere to, to get rid of your waste. Um, they're gated and you can now book them online as well. So I think we'll do a review of those places soon um, mm. and they now have hundreds of airs across France and, and they're expanding into the rest of Europe as well so they're also highly recommended yep and I think that probably rounds it off yeah. uh, knowing you guys there's probably something that we haven't uh, covered <laughs> um, of course there is but leave a comment if you want us to cover something specific uh, or you have any questions we're always happy to, to answer um, yeah and as usual yeah, if you liked the video, give us a thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't, subscribe. And uh, we will see you on the, on next, the next video. Take, Take care. care, guys. Bye. Bye.